All right, let's start this way. We're going to talk about Abraham. All right, we're continuing. Let me ask you to first give me, just call them out, some promises of God. I don't know how many there are in the Bible, 3,000 or something. Give me, give me some, just shout, shout it out. He will be with us always. What else? I'll make you a great nation. Okay, to Abraham specifically, I'll make you a great nation. I'm really meaning just some sort of, gen that you put out of your precious promise box in the morning. My grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. Strength is made perfect in weakness. Give me some others. Never leave you or forsake you. Peace. My point is, and your, your mind's already racing. The, uh, there's a lot of them. My question is, do you, do I believe the promises? Faith, we're talking about faith. We love to say the promises, but we don't know if we believe them until that faith is tested. Prayers for healing. Prayers for, is he really with us when all hell's breaking loose? It doesn't feel that way. Uh, this is what we're talking about tonight. And this is not just history related to Abraham. This actually is very personal, the testing of faith. Let me just dive in. Um, understanding faith. Abraham is the supreme example of faith. And I just made the footnote there at the bottom. In English, we use the word faith as a noun and the word believe as a verb as if they're almost two different things. But in Greek, it's the same word. So don't distinguish between believing and faith. It's the same, we're talking about the same thing. And Abraham, as we saw last week, is the father of all who believe. He is the poster child for faith. When Paul talks about faith, he says, my example is Abraham. All right? Paul calls him the father of all who believe. Therefore, understanding faith is necessary not only in helping us to discover the significance of Abraham, but also in learning what it means for us. Um, let me have some volunteers on this. Who will look up 11, Hebrews 11.6? 11, I, I want somebody to stand up and read these verses. Who's got it? Hebrews 11, 6. Okay, Martha. Who's got John 6, 28, 29? Just real good. Who's got Acts 16? I'm just going to let you help me. Great. Thank you. Who's got Ephesians 6, 16? Thank you, Dan. Who's got Romans 14, 23? Dave and John 3, 18. Great. Barb, got it here. Let's just talk about, real quickly, I don't want to get bogged down in this, I'm introducing faith, because we're going to see tonight three ways that Abraham's faith was tested. He had left Ur of the Chaldees, he left everything. It's like, isn't it obvious? I believe. And God said, we'll find out. It's, it's almost cruel. I, I don't, uh, but I sort of, have experienced that. It's like, God, I've, I was a missionary for heaven's sake. I, of course I believe. And God says, really? And then there's a test. Who's got 11, 6, Hebrews 11, 6, Martha? 11, 6. And without faith it is impossible to please God. There you, okay, that's what we want. Without faith it's impossible to please God. You cannot please God if you don't believe his promises. Basically, you, you don't please him. Who's got John 6, 28 and 29? Thank you. Real loud. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the work of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you trust in him 
Okay, they come to Jesus and said, what must we do to do the work of God? In other words, what does God really want from us? Good question. And Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe in the one he sent. Or your translation says that you trust. Good word. Good word. Good. <laughs> Who's got Acts? So, uh, number two, without faith, we will fail to do the work of God. Whatever we're doing, going to church, reading our Bibles, tithing, if you're not believing, you're not doing what he wants you to do. It's like, really? Nope, that's the point. Uh, who's got Acts 16.30? He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must we do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Okay, what must I do to be saved? Believe. On Jesus. So without faith, number three, we cannot be saved. Who's got the Ephesians 6? Thank you, Dan. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So number four, without faith, we have no shield. We have no protection. You are vulnerable to satanic attacks without faith. This is a pretty impressive list. Who's got Romans 14? This was one you don't hear often. Who did, who's? Thank you. Everything that does not come from faith is what? Sin. So number five, we are unable to do anything but sin if we don't believe, according to the Bible. And who's got John 3, 18? I forgot. Yeah, Barb, thank you. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So what do you have to do to be condemned, according to that verse? Do you have to do bad things? Do you have to murder somebody? You just don't believe. Jesus said you're condemned already. Without faith, number six, we will be condemned and go to hell. Is what I just made it blunt. Hell is a place for unbelievers. That's a pretty... So we're introducing the walk of faith. With faith, let me just fill these in, but that got us all on the, working at it. Nothing is impossible. These verses have always bothered me. <laughs> With faith, number two, we receive whatever we ask in prayer. It's like, really? <laughs> it's, uh, this is what Jesus says. These are not my words, these are his. If you've got a problem, take it up with him. Uh, number three, with faith, we can... <clears throat> Overcome the world. We almost sang tonight, faith is the victory. That was the other one I was going to sing. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Isn't that a great one? Uh, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. This explains why, see, followers of Jesus are called believers. <laughs> Interesting, we use it so much we don't think about what it means. Oh, you're a believer. It means you have faith. Faith is the characterizing, the, the defining characteristic. And the Christian religion, at least in the pastoral epistles, is called the faith. Um, I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. What do you mean the faith? What's the faith? Well, it's the it's the embodiment of the, of the Christian way of life. It's okay. So already we see the importance of faith. What, and Abraham is our illustration. Faith is not, it's always helpful. I used to do this in baptism class, and I never got tired of just sort of going through this. To understand what faith is, it's always helpful to say what faith isn't. Because there's a lot of confusion out there. 
Faith is not one optimism. <laughs> Some people are just born with a rosy disposition. And that doesn't mean necessarily they're people of faith. It just means they have an optimistic outlook on life. A cheery, positive outlook on life is not faith. People that say, um, don't worry, everything will work out in the end. I've heard people say that like in hospital rooms. You know, when you're there for a pastoral visit, you're trying to encourage faith, and somebody in the room will say, oh, it's going to work out. It's like, and people sometimes say, oh, they have faith. It's like, that's not necessarily faith. That's just optimism. I thought of the song today. Do you remember, a, I believe, for every drop of rain that falls? I really hate that song. <laughs> I, you, you don't have to agree, but it is just, it's, I, I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. I believe that somewhere in the darkest night, a candle glows. I believe that someone in the great somewhere, it's like, I've heard that sing in church. It's like, what, what are we singing about? <laughs> I think we're singing about faith in faith, not faith in God. A lot of people have faith in faith. Remember, that there's a, we watch these movies with our kids, but a girls' basketball movie called Believe. Believe. You know, it's a great, but it's, what do they believe in? Well, they believe in themselves. They believe in belief. But that's not what we're talking about with Abraham. He's not, he doesn't believe in belief. And he certainly doesn't believe in himself. Not after tonight. I, oh, my goodness. It's, uh, so, number two, it's not sincerity. Some trust in chariots, some in, in horses. Uh, but sincere and passionate faith in an unworthy object is foolishness, not faith. I, I'd, I'd love to give you more illustrations, but I want to get to our text. Number three, faith is not, this is the big one, mental assent or mental agreement. The proverbial man on the street who says, oh, I believe in God. What he means is, I believe there is a God. I believe a deity exists. And the book of James says, the demons believe that, and they tremble. That is not what we're talking about. Just agreeing that even Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead. That will not get you to heaven believing those facts. The devils know that. They don't just believe it, they know it. Okay, uh, and number four, another big one, a leap in the dark. Faith is a leap, but I would encourage you, please don't jump in the dark. <laughs> People get hurt. It's not wise to jump in the dark, but if God makes a promise and says it's okay to jump into the promise, then jump. But it's not a leap in the dark. Uh, if you like to read the existentialist authors, they're big on commitment. Make a co just even if, because life is absurd, but just plow forward anyway and commit yourself wholeheartedly to making sense out of that which is senseless. I, what do you do with that? Yeah, it's. it's Many seem to believe that what matters is the leap, the commitment, being authentic. No, that is putting faith in faith. Faith never saved anyone. I'm going to say that again. We're talking about faith tonight. Faith never saved anyone. Faith in Jesus will save anyone who does it, but not just faith. Faith just connects you to the one who can save you. It is the object of faith that is of supreme importance. How are we doing? Are we introducing the subject? So what is faith? 
Faith is, and we saw some of this last week, trust. It's not just intellectually acknowledging some truth. It's committing yourself. There will certainly be an intellectual component to faith. And there may well be an emotional component. But at its core, biblical faith is, anybody want to guess at the word, volitional. That's Dan's right with me here. Not just, it's volitional, which means it's an act of the will. Volitional, that's such a good word. It is taking God at his word. If Jesus said, lo, I am with you always, Just say, Lord, I'm going to hold you to that. And I'm not jumping in the dark. This is not just an imaginary friend. What a cruel thing. I've had some atheists say, oh, it's you and your imaginary friend. It's like, this is, no, this is a promise from God himself. Number two, in this sense, faith is almost indistinguishable from obedience. And I think I was 35 years old before I really understood this. I mean, this was slow coming to me. That when the Bible talks about faith, when the Bible talks about obedience, it's two sides of the same coin. Just listen to some of this language in Scripture. Hebrews 11:8. By faith, Abraham obeyed. <laughs> and he left Ur of the Chaldees. God says, come, I'll show you a country... And Abraham said, okay, I'm going to take you at your word. That's faith. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever, and this is a, a Hebraic kind of parallelism. It's, it's putting opposites together. So he says, whoever believes has life. And whoever you expect him to say does not believe does not have life. In fact, that's the verse that Barb read. It actually said, but in John 3, 36, the opposite of faith is not unbelief, it's disobedience. Third bullet, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about, I love this phrase, the obedience of faith. This is how the book of Romans begins and ends probably the greatest book ever written about faith is the book of Romans. And Paul says, what I'm talking about is the obedience of faith. It's like, and I say this because there, our pews in America are full of people who see no correlation between faith and obedience. And they'll say, well, I'm not living for the Lord right now, but hey, I believe. It's like, I'm on the warpath. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if uh, you got to love this guy, listen to just, I had a hard time choosing the quote to put in here. There's a number of good ones. The Cost of Discipleship. Quote, Faith is only real when there is obedience, never without it. And faith only becomes faith in the act of obedience. It's a good Lutheran writing in Nazi Germany when the Lutheran Church of Germany was full of believers who didn't obey. And Bonhoeffer says, you're unbelievers. And they kicked him out of the church, basically. Number three, faith does not save us, but it is the link that connects us to the one who can. That's so good, I'm going to say it again. Faith itself doesn't save us. Faith connects me to the one who can save me, and his name is Jesus. But if I put my faith in Buddha and believe with all my heart, I will not be saved. If I put my faith in anything other than the one name given under heaven by which we can be saved. 
And I like to think of faith as an electric extension cord where you're just, it's like I picture myself, you know, sort of standing at the Hoover Dam with a little extension cord and say, can I plug this in here? <laughs> and I think God smiles and says, no, that'll work. But if you brought a bigger cable, it might, you'd be surprised how much is awaiting you. But faith as a grain of mustard seed plugged in to the Hoover Dam is very powerful. But if you're at the Hoover Dam, why don't you just bring a cable and let's light up Los Angeles. Don't just light up your, your lamp. Okay. Small faith in a great God is preferable to great faith in a false God. That will preach. Note the prepositions in Ephesians 2.8. Let me just, you know this verse, but let me just let you write it down. For by grace you have been saved, what? Through faith. By gra grace saves you when you plug in your extension cord. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, what? For good works. So by grace, through faith, for good works. Let's have the benediction. I mean, that's just, that's, that's it. By grace, through faith, for good works. And that's Abraham. Grace called him, faith got him going, and he did a lot of good works. All right. The test of faith. We're about to get to Genesis 12. We have seen how God called Abraham last week and gave him two incredible promises. More than two, but really they are summarized in two. One, to make him a great nation, meaning he will have many children. Abe, I know you're 75 years old, and I know Sarah is 65, but you guys... And he's, tonight he's going to say, as many as the sand of the sea, or the stars. And the second promise is to give him what? First, it's children, and second, land, the land of Canaan. So these are the two big promises that caused Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees and say, I'm all in. God says, you're going to have a family and you're going to have a land. You're going to have a people, and you're going to have a place. It's what we all long for. We briefly, last week, were introduced to two possible problems. Sarah is barren. <laughs> Nothing was said about this last week, except that she's barren, and then God says, and I'm going to make you numerous. And I'm thinking, how are you going to do that? Okay, we're getting there. And number two thing we saw last week, an illusion, there are Canaanites living in the land. Okay, we're about to see the test of faith. Abraham's left everything, saying, Lord, I'm going to take you at your word. You're going to make me numerous. You're going to give land Letter B, untested faith is no faith at all. I think that's sort of the take home for tonight. Untested faith is no faith at all. So God arranges a series of tests that will prove the authenticity of Abram's faith. Some of these tests he will pass. We're going to see tonight. He fails two tests and passes one. We're going to see three. But he's testing him. But he's not yet at the final exam. The final exam is the one that counts. And this is where this makes the whole story of Abraham moving. It's like, where's this going? Well, it's going to Mount Moriah. 
which is later Calvary, where a father sacrifices a son in faith. It's like, really? That's where this is going? Um, some of these tests he will pass, some he will fail, but when he comes to the supreme test on Mount Moriah, Abraham passes with flying colors. Uh, it'll take us about three or four more weeks to get there. Anybody know what God says after the test when he is ready to sacrifice his son? God says, now I know that you fear me. And I don't know about you, but that just sort of takes my breath away and saying, is that what this was all about? Don't you trust Abraham? I mean, he left everything. He's doing his best. But when Abraham took a knife to his only son, the son of promise, God says, that's what I was looking for. Now I know. And I don't, anyway. Um, let her see. So why does God give tests? Uh, when I ask that question, this is how my mind works, but my mind flashes back to 10th grade geometry class and Mrs. Inez Johnson. Oh my goodness, horn-rimmed glasses, you know, big hair. <laughs> this is Westover High School, Albany, Georgia. We knew why she gave tests. She was a cruel, sadistic woman. <laughs> and she liked nothing better than to inflict pain on us poor, innocent students. You know, it's like she just sort of fit this mold. That's why she gave tests. I've thought about that actually a lot. And, uh, you know, now I think, no, I'll, I'm, no, I'm not completely sure, but I don't think she was cruel. I think she was saying, I'd rather not spend next year with you students in this class again. <laughs> so I'm going to give you tests and a big one at the end to see if you're actually learning what we're talking about. And I'm actually giving you these tests because I care about you and I want you to do well. That's about the best illustration I know of why God sometimes allows all hell to break loose in our lives. And my reaction is, God, you're cruel. You're messing with me. You're hurting me. Why do you beat me up? And God basically says, well, I know it feels that way. I get that. But I'm just wanting to know if you, you're getting it so that I can, God can come to the point where God says, now I know. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Um, so why does God give tests? Is he cruel? Isn't taking that initial step of faith, leaving Ur and starting on the journey, enough? Two passages in the New Testament are instructive. James 1. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that, and look at the words, the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. Endurance or steadfastness. King James is patience. And what's that about? Let endurance or steadfastness have its full effect so that you may be perfect. I debated whether to make the blank perfect, complete, or lacking in nothing. And right before I sent this to press, I'd had it under lacking in nothing. I said, no, let's just go with the word perfect. God is working on our perfection. 
Look at the one in Peter. It's just as amazing. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while. I love that. A little while. If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that, and here's a similar phrase, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in, so when you pass the test of faith, what's the result? Anybody know? Praise and glory and honor. Three words there, just praise and glory and honor. And I, I think I've got the impression when we get to the celestial city and we've been victorious in just believing the promises in spite of the hell of our lives, you know, there's going to be sort of a standing ovation. It's like, yeah, you did it. You believed in the goodness and the grace of God while you lived in Babylon. That's pretty remarkable. And let me tell you, it is. And I, okay. All right. That was a little longer than I wanted. We got 20 minutes. We're going to look at three, te three tests of Abraham. And I'm, I'm mainly, uh, if I've introduced it well, I can go quick. Uh, it'll, it'll go quick. But let me start this way. You got your Bibles? Let me just read you two verses. Gen Genesis 12, verse 7. I'm going to read you something we saw last week. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this, what? Land. Now remember that word land, talking about Canaan. Verse 10, he gets to Canaan. Now there was, what? <laughs> Famine in the land. It's like, I left Ur? For this? So Abram packed his bags and left. He said, I'm going to Egypt. I just love the Bible. I just love So this is his first test. I mean, he's right out of the gates. He's traveled, well, it's 600 miles from Haran. It's probably about 1,100 miles from Ur to Canaan, which is a long way in our day, much less in his day. He gets there. And God says, welcome to the land of promise. Oh, there's a famine going on. All right. Letter A. The test, I'm going to call it, of adversity. You're believing the promises. You really are. You're walking. You're, you're, follow, you're believing the promise. God's going to give me the land. And then... There's a twist to it that just feels like, is this a joke? I, don't, I wish you knew how many people I've heard say to me something like this uh, as a pastor. You know, before I gave my life to Jesus, life was actually fairly, fairly decent. But when I gave my life to Jesus, all hell broke loose. <laughs> it's like... That's a pretty authentic sign you're on the right trail. <laughs> and you're laughing at me because we all, we've all experienced that. The key question is, and I'm not sure I've said this the best way yet, but can I trust God when he disappoints me? And I just used the word underperforms. <laughs> Lord, you're not measuring up to my expectations. And Canaan does not look like... It's, the, the promised land is rather unpromising. And so when Abraham hits this test, all it says was, he went to Egypt. <laughs> so Abraham's grade is an F. I'm going to just give him an F. He fails. Now, a few comments about this. This is, this is so good. This is so good. Number one, 
When Abram discovered that the land of promise resembled Death Valley, he packed up and left. Did I leave Ur for this? Is this some kind of a cruel joke? No, it's a test. But Abraham wasn't ready. The faith that got him to Canaan wasn't strong enough to sustain him there. The faith that got him to the land was not able to keep him there. He still needed to learn. And I love how human he is. He's, he's not this giant that is perfect. He's, uh, number two, there's no indication that he prayed or sought God's will. This would have been a good place for him to build an altar <laughs> and say, Lord, what am I supposed to do? That would have been a good response. He didn't do that. He just did what seemed logical at the time. I love the story. Supposedly, somebody asked Napoleon um, after the defeat in Russia, you know, why did you invade Russia? And supposedly he said, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> I really like that story for some strange reason, because that's a lot of my life. I look back and say, why did, I, why did I do something so stupid? Well, at the moment, it seemed logical. Let's go to Egypt. This is not the only time in Scripture when the people of God put their trust in Egypt. Isaiah said centuries later, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel. Oh my goodness, that's a great verse. Number three, once on the wrong path, however. So now you've got the father of faith in a place he's not supposed to be. And it just sort of unravels. Other decisions only deepen the crisis of faith. At least three bad consequences happen in Egypt. And we're about to read them, but let me give them to you. A, marital strife between Abraham and Sarah. Where God, Abraham says to Sarah, who's a 65-year-old, drop-dead gorgeous woman, pretty interesting, just tell them you're my sister. So it will go well with me. Literally, that's his words. This is about me. So if Sarah puts you in his harem, if Pharaoh puts you in his harem, I'd love to know how Sarah felt about that. So marital conflict is a recurring theme in the Abraham-Sarah story. And it's going to get, and Sarah is not innocent in all this either. Letter B, Lot, Abram's nephew, is captured by the glitter of Egyptian worldliness. He falls in love with the city of man. And Lot is a, prob is a lot of problem. <laughs> Uh, because in just a moment, when Abraham says, we got to separate, which way do you want to go? Lot says, I want to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah because it looks like Egypt. You'll see it. And when I was in Egypt and I saw the culture and the pyramids, the pyramids were probably six or eight hundred years old at this point. I mean, this... And see, Abraham becomes rich because Pharaoh made him rich. Because Abraham had given him his sister. Abraham, so Pharaoh blesses Abraham with ill-gotten gain. You're, um, and among the Egyptian female servants was a woman named Hagar. 
the Arab-Israeli conflict is born right there. This is an incredible story. Um, okay, so test number one, we're just going to call it adversity. There's famine in the land of promise. Abraham fails. Let's read the next story. And uh, I didn't time this quite right because I'm not going to give these the full we weight they deserve. Let's pick it up at verse 11. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say, you're my sister, that it may go well with me. Not sure what they're going to do to you but I'll be okay. You're just going to be in Pharaoh's harem. It's like, this is Abraham and Sarah. And that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarah was gorgeous. 65 years old. This, I, I wish I had a picture of her. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's, and I think the word there is harem. I mean, that's what it means, into his house. She was taken into his house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, and I'm certain Hagar was one of them, female donkeys and camels. I mean, Abraham is wealthy. He gave Pharaoh his sister. It's like, it may go well with me. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house. One of the promises to Abraham was, I'll make your name great, and all nations will be blessed through you. Abraham goes to Egypt, and Egypt is cursed because Abraham showed up. It's like, this is not turning out the way it's supposed to. The Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What have you done to me? Why did you not tell me that she's your wife? Why did you say she's your sister? So that I took her for my wife. So that I took her for my wife. We're left to guess what went on while Sarah was in Pharaoh's keeping. But I tend to think what happened to her is what happened to all women in Pharaoh's wife, harem. It, it, and this is the mother of the Messiah. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away. And just get out of here. It's sort of what Pharaoh said to Moses and the children. Just leave. Just leave. Okay. I, I love these stories. It really quickly. We're at letter B. We're going to call this the test of threats to my self-interest. I'm not sure I've named it right. But this is another test of faith. I'm going to give you not just land, I'm going to give you children. And later on he's going to make it precise. Through Sarah, I'm going to give you children. Are you really going to put her in Pharaoh's harem? The mother of God's people. Uh, this just takes your breath away. Uh, the key question here is, can I trust God when I'm in danger? What grade do you want to give Abram? I'm going to give him an F. <laughs> Just like, Abraham. Some quick comments. Pharaoh collects women for his harem. That's just what he does. Abraham places self-protection over his marriage. Some of those Footnotes are really good. 
His motivation is brazenly selfish. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you. I, I, that's about as ugly a statement. To save his own skin, he puts his wife and the mother of the future Messiah in the harem of a pagan king. Number two, actually Sarah is Abraham's sister. They have the same father but different mothers. This is what Abraham explains to Abimelech when 25 years later he pulls this same stunt again. And you won't be surprised to learn that Isaac, their child, pulls the same stunt with his wife, Rebekah, with King Abimelech. And I just put in the footnote, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So Abraham's story is a half-truth. She's my sister. Liar, deceiver, cheater, you're, you're... Three, Abraham may have failed to protect his wife, but God didn't. He sent plagues on Pharaoh and his house. Though God had called Abraham to be a blessing to the nations, he had become a curse. And finally, number four, in verses 18 and 19, is surely one of the most ironic scenes in all Scripture. A pagan king rebuking the patriarch Abraham and giving him a lecture on morality. <laughs> that is just, I don't even know what to do with that except say, Lord, this is and why I love the Bible is nobody could make these stories up. I mean, it just, it, it doesn't work like this. All right. Back to the Bible, chapter 13. Uh, let's read a few verses. So Abraham, he left Egypt. And wouldn't you like to know the conversation between Abraham and Sarah as they... Yeah, we probably don't want to know. Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold, and he journeyed on from the Negeb as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place where he had made an altar at first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. I'll bet he did. Now, let me just, a few comments. You guys are so good. We really, we're, we're going to wrap this up. The interlude, because there's one more test, but before the third test, which Abraham gets an A on, you'll be pleased to know. Maybe an A plus. But before he does that, he goes back to Bethel. On returning to Canaan, Abraham goes back to Bethel. Those words are huge because that's where Abraham first talked with God. It's sort of like what happens to me when I go in Hughes Auditorium. <laughs> you know, it's just like, okay, this room means something for a as Barians often, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. Sobered by the debacle in Egypt, Abraham needs to reset his compass. I like that phrase. And get back on track. In calling on the name of the Lord, perhaps Abraham said something like this. Lord, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> Egypt, I blew it. I stepped out of your plan for my life. I left the land you gave me. And I failed to love my wife. Can you forgive me? Will you give me another chance? And all the tests have either to do with the promise of children or the promise of the land. I hope you're seeing that. This is what's being tested. 
Abraham, can you trust me for the land? Can you trust me for children? Let me uh, read a little bit, and if you'll give me five minutes, this will work. I Pick it up at verse 5. And Lot, who went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Verse 8. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, I'll go to the right. If you take the right hand, I'll go to the left. So uh, Uncle Abraham, the senior member of the partner partnership, is saying to the junior member, you can choose. And he knows very well how worldly and double-minded Lot is. Lot lifted up his eyes, which is what Eve did in the Garden of Eden when she looked, and he saw the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the Garden of the Lord, like the land of what? And Lot said, that reminds me of Egypt. And the valleys of the plain, the cities of the valley, were Sodom and Gomorrah particularly, and they didn't look like the Dead Sea area looks today. It was a well-watered paradise. And Lot says, that's what I want. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to see that in about three or four weeks. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abraham settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent near Sodom. He saw Sodom, then he moved close to Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners. There was something about their sin that put it in a different category. They weren't ordinary sinners. All right, some quick comments. Letter D, the test of conflict. The key question is, can I trust God to watch out for my well-being when there is strife and conflict? I didn't read you the last paragraph, but that's when God says to Abram to walk through the land it's all yours. Abram's grade is an A. Because of ill-gotten gain in Egypt, what's that? It's all time you got to give glory. <laughs> That's right. It is. Thank you. Because of ill-gotten gain in Egypt, Abram and Lot are rich. The land cannot support them both. This creates conflict. As the senior partner, Abram could have resolved the situation by pulling rank. I'm the uncle. I'm the one who got the call. I'm going to decide who gets which territory. Surprisingly, he let his worldly, second-hand faith nephew make the decisions. Something indeed had happened during that worship service at Bethel. Um, we will learn more about Lot as the story of Abraham unfolds. But here we catch a glimpse of his true character. He lifted up his eyes and saw the Jordan Valley, worldliness and double-mindedness. Letter B, Lot moves his tent near Sodom. In the next chapter, we're going to see that Lot is living in Sodom. And in chapter 19, still later, we discover that he's sitting in the gate of Sodom. To sit in the gate means you're a ruler. I'd like to think he may have been the mayor of Sodom. 
lot. He sees it, he moves close, he moves in, and then he just embraces it. This is my home. We're going to get to that story. Letter C. Abraham's motivation for giving Lot his first choice seems twofold. A. My relationship with my nephew is more important than getting my own way. And my parentheses there, if only he had said this concerning Sarah, my relationship with my wife is more important than it go well with me. And letter B, I can trust God to take care of His promises. I don't have to scheme and manipulate to accomplish God's will. God is able to work it out. And I think he was able to say that because he had been back to Bethel. My closing is just where are you being tested? And if this lesson has helped you get back to Bethel, what's God asking you to do about it? And I threw in a good quote of Oswald Chambers there. It's, he, he talks a lot about Abraham in a book called Not Knowing Whither. Uh, but it's, it's really good. It's a devotional treatment. of. A, let me read it to you. At times it appears as if God has not only forsaken His Word, but has deliberately deceived us. I don't know if you've ever felt like, God, you tricked me. We asked Him for a particular thing and expected that it would mean the fullness of the blessing, and actually it has meant the opposite. Upset, trouble, and difficulty all around, and we are staggered until we learn that by this very discipline, God is bringing us to the place of entire abandonment to Himself. That's so good. Abraham, you left everything, but you're not entirely abandoned to God. Not yet. We're going to get there. Your final exam is coming. <laughs> Lord, thank you. Thank you for Abraham and sweet Sarah. We love them both because they're so human. They're so human. Thank you that he's the example of faith. And he learned to believe by just going through these tests. And on some of them he did poorly just like we do. Thank you that you didn't give up on him. Thank you that he went back to Bethel where he got his compass set in the right direction again. Lord, speak to us even as we sleep tonight and birth in us that faith, that assurance that what you have promised, you will indeed fulfill. In the name of Jesus, amen.